it is with deep gratitude I declare this building open and dedicate it to the service of God. It was on the 10th of May 1958 that the London Bible College's present building in London was opened. Now the largest theological college of its kind in Europe, with over 1,200 former students in different parts of the world, it has seen only 25 years of service. For the next few minutes, we would like to take you back to those days when London Bible College was nothing more than an inspired thought in someone's mind. It was as far back as 1935 I became concerned about the need for a Bible college in London, similar to the BTI in Glasgow, for our crusader leaders and seniors. I approached Dr. Douglas Johnson, secretary of the IVF, who eventually by 1938 was also convinced of this need. We were amazed to find that in the English-speaking world outside Britain, many of the big cities, Toronto, Melbourne, Cape Town, and of course the USA, had such colleges, but not London. The late Mr. A.J. Vereker, one of the prime movers in founding London Bible College. But couldn't people who wanted to take a theological degree go to any of the established universities? I put this question to the Reverend Hugh Evan Hopkins. Yes, they could, but in those days, most evangelicals were nervous of theology, uh, certainly as in the big universities. And um, I think this was envisaged that if there were the men and women with talent and scholarship, that it would be possible to have a positive uh, outlook towards the Bible and still also uh, reach academic standards theologically. Uh, people who wanted this kind of training had to go up to Glasgow or somewhere like that, and there really wasn't anything, and there should have been in London. And, uh, of course, it was a, a sort of airy idea until we got Mr. Lang in on it and the possibilities of financial and practical help. This was the turning point. It could still have been a matter of prayer and not of action until he stepped in as a Christian layman and really and truly one owes more to him and his support than perhaps anyone else on the practical because he was all for it and he spent a lot of his time and talent on it. Mr. Lang, now Sir John Lang, didn't take much persuading when Mr. Vereker and Dr. Johnson outlined what they had in mind. I too had felt for some time that there was a need for a Bible college in London and my heart immediately responded to all that they told me. I had at that time purchased a site in Madelebone Road for development. There was a large old house standing in about a quarter of an acre of land. We made a thorough inspection of the site and the building, even climbing through a skylight on the roof. And although the building was scheduled for demolition, we thought it would be a splendid place to start the college. To begin with, there wasn't a very warm response to these suggestions of a college, but by May 1939, it was decided to arrange a meeting to set up an ad hoc committee, and accordingly, a letter was sent to the leaders of several evangelical societies and others who might be interested. Several of those who have shown the most interest in the project have been consulted, and they have suggested 2.30 p.m. on Thursday, May the 25th, for this meeting. It will be held at the offices of the IVF in Bedford Square. We should like to give you an earnest invitation to be present at this meeting. Things are developing sufficiently rapidly for certain definite proposals to be brought before the meeting, for instance, as to the important matter of the leadership of the proposed institute. Several of these representative committee meetings were held, but after the outset of war, the whole project looked like being dropped. It wasn't until October 1942 that more progress was made when the Reverend Evan Hopkins, Dr. Johnson and Mr. Vereker met one wet and stormy evening in the blackout at Tattenham Corner and resolved that the project must not be dropped. That was a famous meeting. Uh, there was a hostelry there where we gathered and we had coffee and prayer. Uh, and, uh, and this is really where we sat down and began to write notes of what we wanted what we felt was right. I shall never forget that evening. And uh, I think that is probably the beginning of a practical way. 
With renewed enthusiasm, they decided the thing to do was to make a start somewhere. We didn't want to wait indefinitely, so we, we started on uh, correspondence courses. That was the first thing, if I remember right. I remember them clearly, drawing up all sorts of syllabuses over those. Leslie Wilkinson was one of the leading lights, because he was then principal of Oak Hill College, I think. And he gathered round him people like dear Miller, who had a kind of a Bible correspondence course in hand. And um, we drew up the syllabuses, and then we began some lectures, knowing that uh, this was nothing to what would happen when peace came. The evening lectures were held first in a building owned by the Scripture Gift Mission, and then later in St. Andrew's Courthouse, Hoburn. I gave one myself, I remember, in St. Andrew's Courthouse on, uh, what was it, on um, comparative religion, I think, because I'd written a small book on the subject, and it was very well attended, and um, it was really quite a thrill. These evening classes were led by several visiting lecturers who had specialised knowledge in particular fields. Mr. Carey Oakley was one of them. The first lecture was in January 1946, and I have very vivid memories of it. I had heard that the college had acquired a site at 19 Marylebone Road, and I travelled up there on this winter evening to find the whole place in darkness, and I couldn't get entrance anywhere. Then it suddenly occurred to me that I'd come to the wrong place, that I ought to have gone to St Andrew's Hoban. So I made my way back to St Andrew's Hoban, arriving about five and twenty minutes late, and found Dr Kevin holding forth to the assembled students in my place, waiting for me to turn up. Included amongst the students at this lecture were the college's first eight full-time students some of whom were already studying for their Bachelor of Divinity degree. On the way home, after taking one of these lectures, Mr Oakley found that he was following three of these full-time students. It was a dark evening, and we were both going in the same direction. They didn't see me, but I heard them talking to one another. I had been trying to explain some rather abstruse grammatical point in New Testament Greek, and I distinctly heard one of the students say to the other two, I couldn't understand a word the man said from beginning to end. But fortunately, that seems to have been an exception, because enthusiasm for the lectures continued to grow. Not having permanent premises was of course a drawback, and so the Marylebone site was reconsidered. But during the war, it had been left vacant, and the house had become very dilapidated due to vandalism. It was finally decided that the college should have the premises at 19 Marlebone Road. And so during the first six months of 1946, the building was reconditioned, old floorboards were replaced, partitions were put in, extra wash basins and so forth. And it was in the autumn of 1946 that the college went to the site where it has been ever since. At last, London Bible College had a home and students continued coming in ever-increasing numbers. Apart from those few full-time BD students, what sort of persons came to these evening classes? Well, there were both men and women students. Some of them were teachers who'd done a long day's teaching before they came. Some were business men or business women. They were nearly all engaged in some form of Christian work in their own church. They came, I think, because in reading the New Testament in Greek, they found fresh insights, even in passages that they knew quite well in the English version. I remember in particular two ladies who came for years to this reading class on Friday evenings, and I said to them once, well, it's very good of you ladies, after a hard week's work, to come and read New Testament Greek. Don't you get a bit tired? And one of them said, oh, Mr. Oakley, we regard this as our weekly treat. And so the numbers of students grew. They were trained for the ministry, for the mission field, for the teaching profession, 
and many more received instruction to help them in leading church study groups, crusader classes, Bible classes, Sunday school classes and so on. It became obvious that a new building designed specifically to fit the college needs was required and once again it was Sir John Lane who held the answer. I'm very glad that my firm of builders were responsible for the erection of the new building which was opened on May the 10th, 1958. Previous to this, of course, there was the stone laying ceremony when the late Montague Goodman, a good friend, laid the cornerstone, which can be seen by all passers-by in Marylebone Road. On it is the inscription, Thy word is truth. I remember the opening of the new building very well. It was such a time of rejoicing. The building was crowded and seats had to be provided in the car park. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones spoke on the theme in Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God. Well, now there are various matters, it seems to me, that arise out of this statement which is made by the great apostle. Here's the first. Is such a college necessary at all? There are those who seem to think that if you have an experience of conversion, and certain other qualities that you need no more. If you are converted, if you are zealous, if you have the right kind of personality, if you have sufficient self-confidence, if you have ability to remember and to tell stories, and perhaps to sing in addition, why surely nothing more can be required. And they rather resent the suggestion that they should subject themselves to a period and to a process of training and of instruction. But someone may say, what about a man like uh, John Bunyan? What about Spurgeon? What about Parker? What about Moody? To which the answer surely is quite simple. Exceptions prove the rule. And furthermore, if a young man comes forward and quotes these illustrious examples, all we need to ask him is just this. Is he quite sure that he is possessed of the same genius as those mighty men? From a thought in someone's mind to the largest theological college of its kind in 25 years, this has been the story of the London Bible College. And how about the future? Is its work still relevant in the second half of the 20th century? Yes, most certainly. Britain needs Bible teachers, ministers, evangelists, Christian school teachers, and well-taught Christians in all walks of society. The LBC was founded to train men and women in the knowledge of the Bible. And this has been its aim and is still its aim. And in these days when there is so much humanism and so much false teaching, I feel that it is of the greatest importance that there should be men and women trained in the evangelical doctrines and able to pass them on to others with the knowledge of scripture that they have gained in the college. I think this was something God wanted us to do and enabled us to do. And his spirit has been blessing ever since. It, it seems to me that this is really a rather remarkable uh, practical witness to, to those that honor me, I will honor.